Good afternoon, Braden and Kiwanis. You have stumbled into the absolute greatest Kiwanis club in the country. Can I get a yee-haw? Thank you so much for everybody coming here today. We're excited to celebrate Farm City Week. If you don't know our normal thing, you, we stand up at this time, I ring the bell. Um, and at this time, I'm really excited to call up uh, Lynn Howell, the pastor of the Maca Family Worship Center. He's located in the heart of Maca City, and he is a livestock director for the Mantee County Fair Board. Uh, Lynn, come on, bring us up our invocation. Grab a little music while we pray. That's fine. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for today. And Lord, we thank you for organizations such as this that take time to honor those that labor and work hard. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to live in the greatest nation on earth. And Lord, that we live in the greatest state on earth, in the greatest county. But Lord, we also know that with that comes a price. And that price is that we must be diligent in our labor. That we must be diligent in protecting our freedoms. But most of all, Lord, we must be self-sustaining in all that we do. So Lord, today we ask that you bless all the businessmen that are gathered here today. But mainly, Lord, will you bless the farmers and the ranchers and those that labor in the field. That even though they have ups and downs, they're still diligent in what they do. And Lord, that the food that we're eating today came from their crops. And Lord, we ask you to bless all of these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now join us when we sing. You may be seated. All right, so we're going to do things. Uh, we're going to do things a little different here today. Um, no mic. It's okay. Um, so, guys, we're gonna we're gonna continue on with the program. I'm going to use my. Uh, my, my stage voice to get a little enunciation out there to you uh, while we get our mic fixed. Um, so I'm glad you all enjoyed that singing. Sorry, I got to go to this microphone, but the, the, but the house mic is no longer working, so I apologize for that. Um, so at the, at the Christmas karaoke on December the 12th, uh, our own member Henry Lawrence will be uh, setting us up for that uh, while we get some new batteries here. Uh, we have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Christmas tree sales will be going on soon, so please uh, sign up for that on Portal Buzz. Uh, we also have the Salvation Army bell ringing will be occurring, uh, so please uh, you know, sign up for that if you'd like to be part of the bell ringing. 
Um, we're glad to have the Leadership Manatee class with us today. Um, if you don't know, the Bradenton Kiwanis is a big sponsor of Leadership Manatee. A lot of our members are former Leadership Manatee uh, alumni, so we'd love to have you uh, join our club from here. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to go ahead. Look at that. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mac. That's the, the hardest working guy in the business right there, Mac Aldridge. Give Mac one more round of applause, everybody. I mean, the, between the newsletter and audiovisual and the slides, nothing happens here without Mac. So thanks very much. Um, so with that, with that introduction, and my, my time is kind of running short today, I'm going to call up Brenda Rogers, who is the head of our Agricultural Committee, to uh, take away with the program. Thanks, President Miner. I'm real happy to be here. This is one of my favorite days of the year, and um, part of it's because we get to celebrate agriculture, and um, we always have a really interesting program, and today's not going to be any exception to that. I will let you know that the front row is available. Neil Henry will not be coming to the lectern today, and we're not doing anything about Gallagher this year. So um, <laughs> if, you're, if you remember last year, we had a big celebration before the celebration. So it's safe. You're safe. You'll notice on your table that there, there are some um, items of the bounty of the harvest here in Manatee County, things that are grown here. And um, you're welcome to share those with your folks at your table when you get ready to leave. Don't take them now. We want them in the pictures. But when you um, get ready to leave, you can, you can dismantle the, the centerpieces. But I'd like to bring your attention to the publication that's on the table. And we call this Ag Facts. And it gives you, if you want to play trivia with your neighbors, you can um, ask them questions about agriculture in Manatee County. And um, you'll have all the answers right there. But we, we do have a just a wide variety of agriculture uh, commodities that are produced here. And um, it is a, it's big business in our local economy. And um, we're happy that you're here to celebrate our produce, our production, and um, those, as um, Pastor Lynn said, um, who toil the soil to provide the food that's on our tables every day. So um, just Take those, take those brochures with you if you want to share it with somebody who you think needs to know and needs to appreciate food and what happens here in Manatee County, please share that. First, I'm going to, um, we're going to introduce some of our past agriculturalists of the year. And um, first is uh, Mr. John Peachy, who was named Agriculturalist of the Year in 1996. And we'll hold our applause until I go through all of them, but Mr. Peachy's waving his hand, so um, please, please acknowledge Mr. Peachy right over there. Um, next is the 1998 um, recipient of Agriculture of the Year, and it's Richard Alberg, and he's down front, and um, Richard was also the club president here at Bradenton Kiwanis in the year 83 and 84, so double thank you to him. Next is um, Mr. Jim Parks, 2005's recipient, and I don't see where. <laughs> and 2009 was yours truly. And um, then 2010, Mr. Jim Strickland, who will be our. 2009 was yours truly. And um, then 2010, Mr. Jim Strickland, who will be our speaker. And um, we'll introduce him in, in, again in just a, just a couple minutes. And then um, in 2012 was Mr. Irvin Shannon, also down here in front. He's going to stand. Thank you, Irvin. And then in 2014 was Mr. Buddy Keen. I don't see Mr. Buddy, but I know he's here. He's hiding. Oh, I see his hand in the air over the cameras. Very good. Uh, 2015, Priscilla Wisnett Trace, down front. Um, 2016, Mr. Hugh Taylor, also in the back. 2017, Mr. Mitchell John. There on the side, thank you. 2018, John Hamilton. Okay, thank you, John, back here. 2020 was Mr. Cully Rao. Okay, he, Cully's up front. 2021 was Mr. Cliff Coddington. Cliff's in the back, he's raising his hat. And then in 2022 was Mr. Peter Volley. Thank you. There you have 
23, I'm not <laughs> And I'm not giving up 23 yet. You'll have to wait a few more minutes. Okay, and then we also have our Leadership Manatee class with us today, and I'm going to ask the, the class if you would stand. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We look, we're looking forward to our Ag Day tour tomorrow. But I want to mention that one member of the class, Mr. Jerry Dakin, is, was also inducted into the Agricultural Hall of Fame in 2021. So, Jerry. All right. Next, I'd like to recognize our um, elected and governmental officials. If you are either elected or you are a government um, administrator, please, please stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you and um, your support of this event each year and are happy that you're here with us today. And next, I have the Farm City Week Committee. If you serve on the Farm City Week Committee, would you please um, wave, stand up, wave your hand? Yes, thank you, thank you. This committee puts a lot of work in behind the scenes and um, delivers high quality every single year, and we're most appreciative. And um, then I would also like to recognize those who actually toil the soil. If you retired and you are, were, were in production agriculture or you currently are in production agriculture, would you please stand? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. At this time, I'm going to ask Patty Keen Freed to come forward, and um, Patty's going to share some words from the Farm City Week Committee. Patty's our chairman. Thank you, Brenda. Um, as Brenda said, I am the chair of the Manatee County Farm City Week this year. Our theme is Invention and Innovations of Agriculture. Uh, I am a seventh generation Manatee County native and proud of it. We started our Farm City Week off on November 4th with the Braden and Farmers Market. We had um, youth from the FFA and the 4-H clubs that went down and participated there. On November 9th, we took two chartered buses on our annual farm tour. If you've never done that before, we do that annually. Uh, this year, they went to Jones Green Bean Packing House, Gulf Coast Ag, Wish Farms, and Sweet Bay Nursery. And then we participated on Saturday. Uh, we had some youth from the Palmetto High FFA Club and from Lincoln Middle School. And they uh, marched, with us, marched with us in the parade and handed out flags and Farm City Week pencils to the veterans. Uh, last night, we had our... Manatee River Soil Water District Speech Contest, and um, they awarded the winners at that. Today we have our luncheon, which we announce a little announcement today for our 2023 Outstanding Agriculturist of the Year. Tomorrow, the Leadership Manatee class will go on the Leadership Manatee Tour. And then tomorrow also, we will have our Ag Ventures at the fairgrounds. Tomorrow and on Thursday, we're splitting it up a little bit this year. We'll have over 1,000 third graders at the fairgrounds, and they will learn all about the aspects of agriculture. On the 17th, we will induct our Ag Hall of Fame for the 2023 year, and that will be Mr. Dr. Robert King. And then on the 18th, we'll have our Beef Prospect Show and Workshop, also at the fairgrounds, to wrap up our week. I want to thank everybody for coming, and enjoy your lunch. I'd also like to mention that Dr. Bob King was also a past president of the Branton Qantas Club. Yay, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so next I'm going to ask our speaker to start making his way forward while I um, share some introductory comments. Mr. Strickland, I lost, oh, there you are, right in front of me. I do have old age in my right eye. I was told that this week by a eye professional. So, um, <laughs> 
All right, so uh, Mr. Jim Strickland is the 2023 Florida Farm Bureau Volunteer Communicator of the Year. And this year's recipient bridges the gap between agriculturalists and the environmental community. His dedication extends from his local community to traveling the state, engaging with environmental organizations, policymakers, and the general public. He opens his ranch for educational tours. We're going there tomorrow helping to foster a deeper understanding of sustainability in agriculture. He makes himself available to anyone who wants to learn about agriculture and, and agriculture in, in the aspect of the environment. And we're really happy to, to have him with, with us here today. He's going to share some thoughts about innovations in agriculture, which is the 2023 Farm City Week theme. So please help me welcome Mr. Str Jim Strickland. Is it working in the back, Cliff? Yes. Thank you. I was about 10 years old, and my dad, uh, my dad came to me, and he goes, Son, I think it's time you got off those Shetland ponies you've been riding, and I bought you a new horse. So we went out close to Bob King's ranch, went out there, and there was a nice-looking little gray mare out there being in the cattle business and wanting to be a cowboy my whole life. Um, that was the horse. Problem was, I was 10 years old, and Dad had to saddle with him. He said, all right, I'll see you at the house. <laughs> well, the, the next problem was, we were about three houses down from the Braden Country Club. So think about, as a kid coming through Manatee County at 10 years old, riding a horse across the Braden River, across Wares Creek, going by the only, by the way, the only fast, fast food place that we had in the county at the time was Louie's Box Dinners right there on Manatee Avenue, and you could either get fried shrimp, coleslaw, and baked beans, or, or you could get chicken strips. But there was no McDonald's. You went by a tractor dealership before you got to town right here. Dad told me, he said, well, stop by the uh, courthouse on the way. I'll make sure you're okay. I'm still 10 years old riding this little gray mare named Gray Lady. And I stopped at the courthouse, tied the horse up, walked in. Dad checked on me. He said, all right, I'll see you at the house. Well, Growing up in Manatee County was very special. I don't know if any of you remember Beverly Hillbillies, where the rich folks come to Beverly Hills. Well, that was us with no money, <laughs> none at all. And we had that house, but in the side yard, Dad disc up the side yard and he planted onions and sweet potatoes because he came from a time that during the recession, during World War II, that onions and sweet potatoes lasted a long time without refrigeration. So that's what we had. In the backyard, we had smokehouses. We made our own sausage. We smoked our own sausage. And Dad burned up two smokehouses in West Bradenton. Thank you to West Bradenton Fire Department. <laughs> they, came, they came back. That's a little inkling of where we all came from if you came from agriculture in Manatee County back in those days. But I really want to thank the farm City Week Committee and everybody that's here is still recognizing agriculture in Manatee County. Has it changed? Yes. It's changed dramatically, and I think I'll try to give a little insight of those that you don't understand, perhaps all the nuances of production agriculture in a, in a minute. But it means a lot to still be here, to still be having Farm City Week, and still recognizing so many people in, in agriculture. So what does Florida agriculture look like? This is what it looks like. Two percent of the population are in agriculture, which means there's 98% of y'all which make primarily most of the decisions for us. Most of the population of Florida lives along the coastal communities, Orlando, Miami, Jacksonville, and you make those decisions for us. We're 2%. We are very frugal. We don't make a tremendous amount of money per acre off of the farms. We risk a lot of money when we borrow money. So that's why we need to have this Farm City Week project. This is why we need to collaborate on mutual goals of which we want to see for this great state of Florida. There's 23 million people that live here. A heck of a lot more that come and visit here. We're in a subtropical region of the world, which means every invasive species that comes from Central and South America lands in South Florida. Brazilian pepper, hyacinths, let's keep going, tropical soda, apple, Kogan's grass, and pythons. So <laughs> here we are. Here's what I've learned along the way because I have a high school education. I went to school with Carol and DC and a couple more here. 
and it was it was quite a time back then. We all surfed back then. It was, am I going to be a cowboy? Am I going to be a surfer? <laughs> DC told me, I think, yeah, you were a good surfer, right? No, nah, not really. But I really loved Manatee County. I loved the fact that I could surf. You could hitchhike with a surfboard on Manatee Avenue, and your parents felt safe at that time in our lives. So here's the cowboy that learned. And I learned about conservation. And so conservation ties directly in with agriculture because of the benefits agriculture can do for conservation efforts, all kinds of conservation efforts. And I learned, I met a, I met a lady named Julie Morris. She was with the Florida Conservation Group, of which I'm, I am a director in it now. And what they do is advocate for agricultural practices which will sustain agriculture in Florida, and at the same time, provide those benefits of all of, that all of us benefit from. Water, wildlife corridors, carbon sequestration, carbon dioxide, endangered species habitat, the ability to store water because this state is going to continue to grow. It's a dynamic, sexy state, and everybody seems like wants to live here, and I don't blame them. I want to live here. But what we found by associating with that group initially was that science is going to tell our story, and with our story, perhaps we can help agriculture still be sustainable in Florida. We know there's going to be growth, without a doubt, but we wanted to show the attributes. Attributes come by science and research, not by me standing up here anecdotally telling you what we do for the rest of society, that other 98%. It takes research and data. So we have partners across Florida, Florida Gulf Coast University, Florida Atlantic University, University of Florida, uh, Florida A&M, all have ag programs or conservation programs of which we are all now working together for those same things. 30 years ago, the environmentalists and the, and the agriculturalists were sometimes at odds. Some of the great programs that we have you have one here in Manatee County with your LMAC committee, with the foresight from a lot of folks of buying land like Lake Manatee for a water supply, for buying other lands, and some of them for parks. Just the simple fact of having green space in, in our communities where children can go and children can play, and maybe they'll see some sort of wildlife that lends themselves to what the rest of us do, that 2% out there, out there in the woods. So as we went down this road, all of a sudden we're talking about artificial intelligence. And what can artificial intelligence do for production agriculture? A lot. The third most powerful computer in America, I am told, by University of Florida, is called the Hypergator Computer at University of Florida. So we have partnered with University of Florida a lot on different programs. We know we can't put a bunch of boots on the ground and people taking pictures and writing on notebooks and coming back. We know we need GPS. We know we need sensors in the soil that tell farmers moisture content. We know that we need precision agriculture that will, instead of spraying the whole grove or the whole farm or the whole cow, it will put what it needs, where it needs, in limited quantities. Why? to protect everybody downstream from us, because basically everybody lives downstream from somebody. From the ridge, to the river, to the reef, all of our water has to go, has to go somewhere. So what does agriculture actually do? Well, the easy one is food, jobs, economy, and food security. Food security's got to be kind of a big deal. But that's what we've been hanging our hats, so to speak, on when we talk about agriculture. But there is so much more that we do. Going back, carbon sequestration, water storage, carbon dioxide. You, you know, we can go to the what does a tree do with carbon dioxide. The wildlife corridors, which has become wildly popular across Florida. The legislature two years passed a bill that said any government funding that's used in the state of Florida shall be prioritized to be used in the designated wildlife corridor, which is a corridor that runs from Georgia and Alabama all the way down to the Everglades, all the way, all the way down to Miami. And that is done by Dr. Tom Hochter at University of Florida. He has been working that vehicle for 20 years, and he's also on our 
board of directors and a very, and a very dear friend. Endangered species habitat. Everybody's probably worried about the panther. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people are worried about the panthers. A lot of people are worried about what endangered species is not going to be here 500 years from now. So here are some of the things that we have now that we're actively using. One of them is laser scarecrows. Everybody know, everybody seen the laser scarecrow lately? <laughs> we're using lasers instead of scarecrows or instead of boom boxes that sound like shotguns to drive out predators. And it's run by lasers. It's a certain variant of light within a spectrum of color of which scares things off. That came from technology. That came from research. And it also makes our job easier. Bees. Bees now have the ability, and, and this is cutting edge, of which they will walk into the beehives, collect small bits of herbicide that does not hurt the bee, and then as they pollinate these different varietals of fruits, vegetables, whatever gets pollinated, a lot of wildflowers, that they will actually then protect that plant from species, rather than us spraying wholeheartedly, putting thousands of gallons out there on the soil and in the air. We'll do that. Now, precision spraying to where it can identify, that sprayer can identify through a computer program and, and I don't know if, whether it's LIDAR or it's a chlorophyll content, what invasive is there that needs to be sprayed so as it goes through a grove or it goes through a farm, it will actually go as opposed to like this. It also saves us money. One of, the things that, one of the things that I got recently involved with, besides doing, we've done research on burrowing owl studies, we've done, we did the first coyote study in Florida along with Archibald Biological Station. Uh, we have done panther studies on two ranches, bear studies on two ranches, so it's really helping us. And we've identified gopher tortoise habitat because there is the ability to make money off mitigating gopher tortoises across from development areas. It was a virtual fence. So I was at a wildlife corridor meeting and the head of uh, USDA for this area, he came to me and he goes, have you ever heard of a virtual invisible fence? And I said, yeah, like a dog fence. Nope, he said, we're looking at something much bigger. We're gonna use AI technology and I want you to write a grant. I happen to have, at that time, we do interns quite a bit. I happen to have a young lady from New College and you think, what the heck was she doing on a ranch, living on a ranch in the middle of nowhere? Well, she was a huge benefit because she wrote the whole grant proposal. So we partnered with USDA. We have fenced in 2,000 acres of one ranch. And with that virtual fence, I can, with a click of a mouse, decide where I want to fence, when I want to fence, and actually move cattle. I can set that fence line that's invisible to where it moves every 30 minutes, and, and if it's a long pasture, I can literally move those cows using best management practices, which is also mandated for all of us in agriculture, is specific practices for every commodity group of which we need to adhere to or else we would come under the guidance of DEP, Department of Environmental Prote uh, Protection. Now what we're doing, other than just rotating cattle around, is I'm working with Audubon, I'm working with Julie at Florida Conservation Group, that's, that's our main partner, is we're identifying nesting areas for turkeys, for sandhill cranes, for all kinds of wading birds, and now we're able to, with a click of a mouse, fence out, I can fence out 800, 900 acres of wetlands and about 15 different ponds and keep the cattle out of those wetlands. Let the grass grow up, not bother those nesting birds at the time. What we're also doing now with Dr. Maria Silveira from the University of Florida is we have the instruments to start measuring carbon sequestration because what we want to know is how does grazing land affect carbon sequestration in different ecosystems? Flatlands, uplands, timberlands, cabbage lands. We want to know what we do because for us to be sustainable in agriculture, we have to make money off farm or from the farm. And there's many times those of us in agriculture, production agriculture right here, understand at times we can lose our rear ends in agriculture through things that we have no control over. So what our dream is, is I call it natural capital assets, is the natural capital assets that everybody in society in Florida benefits from, in some way we need to get recognized way down the road. And then once we get the data and we get the research, then we need an, an uh, ecologist to look at it, to verify it, 
we need an economist then to come in and say, what is it worth to society to have a panther? I don't know. What's it worth to have some sort of ecosystem that takes the nutrients out of the water before it gets to Charlotte Harbor or Tampa Bay? What is it worth to have storage areas? We need to know that for us to be in agriculture. For us to be in agriculture for the next 500 years, and I use 500 years because 500 years ago, the first cattle in North America showed up right down the road from us about 80 miles south. So Florida is the birthplace of the entire cattle industry in the United States. And it's kind, of, it's kind of important. Now what we're doing with our stuff is I use one bull. That's where we really get in the weeds. I use one bull for 20 head of cows. I can look on my computer screen any time of day or on my tablet as I'm driving down the road. I can see where all my bulls are. They have an alphanumeric number with an icon. It's a different color than the rest of the cattle. If that bull is over there about two miles from the rest of the herd and he stays over there, we have to go out there and go check him. Maybe he died. Maybe he got crippled. Or maybe he just didn't have a zest for life. <laughs> and he stayed over there in the water hole. If he does, he's going to go see somebody else. So what we'll see into the future is I won't drive over there because we're already using drone technology to identify invasive species, to all of them, with infrared technology, with LIDAR, we're, we're using, using that. And now we're spraying these invasive species on our ranch lands. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a timber man. I am not a citrus grower. I can raise grass and I can raise a cow. So that's, you know, that is, that is my knowledge. So right now, we're looking at throwing a drone up whenever that bull's there. I can throw a drone up with a Latin along, send a drone out there, look at him and go, he's fine, mark him down, we'll catch him next time. Or when if something's having calving problems during calving season, I can do that too. We put a collar around the cow. On that, in that collar is a Verizon cell phone with a GPS unit. We've installed our own cell phone towers on the ranch using a main Verizon tower, GPS satellite. That's how we locate our cows, but it's also how we, we train our cows. It has an audible, just like Pavlov's dog. It has an audible. As you come up to an, an invisible fence and you can't see it, if you don't have a collar on, you run back and two through it, which makes it really friendly for Florida wildlife. It gets an audible. It gets a higher audible, and then it'll get a, what we call a short buzzing feeling in the neck. It's amazing how quickly we've, we train 200 head of cattle on that 2,000 acres to actually respect that. I can put a fence up tomorrow, and they won't be in it. I can move that fence and move all the cattle to the other side and install a fence. It is really good, but, but using that technology truly is the future. So what is the future for the next 500 years? That's what we're talking about is where we've been, looking at new technologies and where we're, where we're going. If we're going to have this quality of life in a lot of our agricultural opinions, that we need to collaborate with scientists, with researchers, with policymakers. They are the key because going back, there was only 2% of the population that is in my world. The rest of them are a little outside of my world. We have to be able to tell our story, and 2% cannot tell our story without the rest of the people understanding. So if we can collaborate with Audubon societies, if we can collaborate with nature, uh, the Nature Conservancy, all of these different organization groups that are now recognized that benefits us at the rapid rate of loss of land that we have in Florida, and it's going to happen. I'm not anti-development. What I'm saying is a lot of us want to get Recognition for what we do for society with water, with carbon, and all of those things. It's going to take research. It's going to take science. Ten years from now, I think you'll have somebody up here speaking to that and, and not me. Federal policymakers are tremendously important. The Vern Buchanan's and the Greg Stubies of the world are absolutely important because the Farm Bill actually helps us tremendously. And without interaction with Congress, Continuing resolutions and, and we're going to shut down the government can immediately on that day affect any farm programs with FSA, Farm Service Agency, immediately done. So that's why it's so important to us. So 
if I had one thing to say, it's like we need to just work together. And, and you've heard it a lot, but we want to work together. We want to work with science. We want to work with technology. And we want to work with you. But the policy makers are going to be the key. From the county commissioners in this room, to the state representatives and the senators, and all the way up to Congress, we need to work with all of them because we do a lot of cost shares to save land for y'all now, but we pay part of the brunt. It's still taxpayers' money. We need to be able to defend by accurate research what you get for your money. If you help us with a cost share in the, farm, in the federal farm bill, we need to be able to tell you what we're doing and what we're accomplishing on your behalf. I want to expand it even a, a, a further. So I happen to still have a little gray mare named Gray Lady, and I'm still riding her. It isn't the same gray lady from 52 years ago. <laughs> But it's the, it's the same one. I want to thank all of you so much uh, for, for coming today and, and honoring all these agriculturalists that are in the room. And with your help, we'll be good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who can name the sitcom that had an agricultural extension agent? Green Acres. Green Acres, thank you. And what was his name? What was his name? Mr. Kimball. Yeah, Mr. Whipple was the store guy. He sold toilet paper in another movie. <laughs> that was, okay, so, so my favorite show growing up was Beverly Hillbillies, and the close second was Green Acres. And when I was in 4-H here in Manatee County, we had an agriculture agent. His name was Terry Montgomery. And Mr. Montgomery, he went on to really great things in entomology at the state level. But when we would watch Green Acres, we would call Mr. Kimball Mr. Montgomery. And so <laughs> we loved Mr. Montgomery. We loved Green Acres, and we learned a lot from both of them. And uh, if you haven't ever seen it, most of you have not seen it, I'm sure. Look it up. It's on Netflix. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Okay, so now's the time that um, we are going to share with you who the um, recipient of the 23 Agriculturalist of the Year is. So bear with me just for a few minutes here. So the 2023 Agriculturalist of the Year is best known for his support of the sciences and application of best practices in production agriculture, an industry he has been part of all of his life. He welcomes ag scientists to run experiments that improve practices to, incre to increase production, reduce negative impacts to the environment, save natural resources, and make work environments safer for those who are working there. All of these things have been developed. He's welcomed guests on agriculture tours to his farming operations, which has led to a better understanding of agriculture's challenges. While some contributions to this community have been made public, the nomination packet included many mentions of support handled on the quiet, anonymous side where he helped individuals through tough times, setting them up for future success. Sometimes it was financial help, and other times it was through learning marketable skills that provided opportunities for career advancement. He's also supported youth programs through, such as 4-H and the Future Farmers of America. Today, he joins his father, who was honored in 1989, and his grandfather, who was inducted in 1971 as a Manatee County Agriculturalist of the Year. Our 2023 Agriculturalist of the Year is known for his expertise and skills on the tennis court, having played for Manatee High School, the University of Florida, and professionally before assuming his role in the family business. By now, you've probably figured out that the 2023 Manatee Agriculturalist of the Year is Mr. Daniel Carl, D.C. McClure. D.C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Please come forward. DC has one daughter, Amanda, and your family's making their way up to the front of the room here. And um, he has, 
He's been a strong supporter of extension in Manatee County, and we just really appreciate you and your contributions and congratulate you today with this. With this well, plan. thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Step over here and smile. <laughs> Lots of smiling today. All right. If you would so, like to say anything, you're welcome to. Well, I, honestly, I when I heard her saying all the things she was saying about the um, unannounced recipient, I thought, they're going to give it to Jim Strickland. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he embraces all, everything you just said uh, off of his speeching. Anyway, I'm, I'm speechless. Thank you. Thank you. Close our meeting, but we're going to do a lot of photos. So okay. Don't go far. Don't go far. <laughs> don't go far. Okay. So um, with that, we thank you for being here for for the annual Farm City Week luncheon. Um, sometimes we surprise them. Sometimes we don't. But um, but you saw it, and it may have been the first time DC McClure was surprised by something. So thank you for helping us with that, uh, Mr. President. If you'll come back and um, close our meeting, thank you. I want to thank again uh, Brenda and all the members of the Agriculture Committee. Can we give Brenda one more round of applause for today? And uh, thank you to Popies for their delicious food today. Congratulations uh, to DC. Congratulations to Mr. Strickland. Thank you for coming today. I've got some golden rulers for you, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do that for you in a minute. Why don't you come on up right now, Mr. Strickland? I got a golden rule for you. Yeah, come on up. Come on up here. Yeah, as, as with tradition with Kiwanis, here's our golden ruler to measure your future success. All right, I got one final announcement, and from Mac, uh, we now have, oh, good, I have five children left. So for our club members, out of the 35 angels we started off with, we've got five boys left. So please see me on the table on the way out if you'd like to pick up one of these and help the child out for this Christmas. Thank you. Wonderful, and uh, there'll be no meeting next week, so we'll return here on the 28th where the Manatee uh, High School Key Club will be part of our meeting, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be working with us at that point. So thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving, and you have, you're adjourned. <laughs>